Hello, hello, good people. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. How is everybody this Sunday afternoon? Hope everyone is doing good. Thank you for joining in. We are live. We thank God. He's a good, mighty God. Let me see. Anybody on already? Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. I hope I hope you are enjoying this series as much as I am and being blessed as much as I am. I know God has been ministering to me a lot here lately and through this um, series and I know that uh, his word never returns to him void. So I am hoping that we are getting blessed and getting edified. Uh, thank you for your comments. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your encouragement offline. Uh, God bless you for that. Let's pray and get into today's lesson. God has something wonderful for us today as always. Father, we love you and bless your name. We're so honored to be on air once again by your grace to share your word. We thank you that your word is mighty, your word is powerful, your word is alive. Lord, it is the seed of righteousness that you sow in our hearts day after day. And it grows and produces the righteousness of God in us. So we thank you and receive it with gladness. And Father, we pray for every ear that will hear this word to be attentive. We pray for every heart, Lord, that you will minister to them. We pray, dear God, for every spirit, that they will submit themselves to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. We bless you and worship you. And Father, we ask that you will have your way in our lives to do that which you have purposed to do in this season. In Jesus' mighty name we pray and believe. Amen. Amen. All right, dear ones, bless the name of the Lord. We have a long lesson today. And quite honestly, I had to break it up because um, as I was preparing, it, it was a lot. It was a lot. And I, I um, just had to uh, trust that we can get something in in this session and then again um, um, in the coming days. Um, like I said, it is a long lesson, but we'll break it up. So today's part A, we're talking about Noah. Uh, thank you, thank you, Sylvia. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for feedback. It's clear, praise the Lord, amen, amen. It's always good to know, sometimes uh, when we get on air, you don't know what the equipment is doing. So it's good to know if you're passing through the airwaves and onto the audience or not. So thank you for your feedback there. Anyway, um, today we are on part 12, and I called it 12A because this is going to be long, and I just had to break it up. I knew we can't, and we honestly cannot get the Word of God in its totality at any given time, but even more so for this lesson today. So today, we're talking about Noah, and you know he's, he's mentioned in Hebrews 11. I think his is verse 7, where it says that by faith... Noah being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became the heir or, or heir of the righteousness, which is according to faith. So Noah is mentioned because he took heed to the warnings that the Spirit of God gave him in his day, in his generation. And he did not just hear and stop at that, but took action upon hearing the word of God. He was warned of things not yet seen, nothing that has ever, ha, had ever been thought of before. Nobody had ever seen rain falling from the sky to water the ground. But Noah, because he knew the voice of his God, and he had walked with God and knew that whatever God says comes to pass. It did not matter to him that the things the Spirit of God was impressing upon him had never been seen before. And so here is a man who is simply going off of the Word of God. 
not having seen with eyes at all, not having experienced at all any of the things that the Spirit of God was impressing upon his heart. And so he moved the Spirit, the Word of God says he moved with godly fear. Here is a man who knows to reverence his God. Here is a man who knows how powerful and how awesome and how great and how true his God is. That he, at the very word of God, he is moved. He's not waiting to see it yet. He's not waiting to experience it yet. He knows nobody has ever seen this, nobody has ever experienced this, but nonetheless, God has spoken. And so it must be true, and it must be coming to pass. And so he moved with godly fear and prepared an ark that saved him and his entire household. The same action and encounter of his day, whilst it provided salvation for him and his household, it brought condemnation to the world of his day. And yet Noah was able to escape being granted uh, 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 as an heir of righteousness that is by faith. So what is it that was happening in Noah's day? What is it about Noah that gets him to be qualified to be ranked among the heroes of faith? I'm going to send us quickly, b before actually I read that verse in, in Genesis, I want to draw our attention, which is our caption verse, this, this lesson. I put it up here, Matthew 24, 37 through 39. And it says, but as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. This is, a portion, this is actually Jesus Christ speaking. And if you would not believe anybody else's words, you better believe the words of Jesus. If nobody else would cause you to move, this one had better cause you to move. I know many of us would like to discount and discredit the deity of Jesus Christ and rank him only as a good teacher, rank him only as God among other gods, rank him only as a prophet. Far be it from that. He is the living God. He is the one by whom and through whom and for whom the worlds were created. It is him that became flesh and dwelt among us. We've already covered this in earlier, earlier lessons. Jesus is the foundation of the building of God. Jesus is the eternal living God. He was, he is, and he is to come. And when he is over here giving us a word, telling us and are forewarning us of the days leading up to his return, we better be taking heed. And so he says, he likens his days, or this coming, his, the days leading up to his coming to the days of Noah. He says, in those days, they were just eating and drinking. That's what's going on today. We're eating, we're drinking, we're marrying, we're giving ourselves in marriage. Until the day Noah entered the ark and did not know. People did not know what was going on. Let me tell you something. That's why you cannot depend only on what is given to you or fed onto you on CNN. You can no longer just depend on what NBC gives you. You can't depend on Fox 4. You can't depend on what the people of your day are doing and saying. Because just like it was in the day of Noah, here is a man, and the Bible calls him a, a, a man of righteousness. He had a righteous spirit. He had his heart sensitized to hear the voice of God. He is over here warning people for a good 120 years. He's telling them a flood is coming. Hey, people, turn away from wickedness. Let us worship the Lord. And nobody paid him any attention. I bet you there were those who thought of him as a lunatic. 
There were those of, oh, who thought of him as having a mental illness. He's speaking of things unheard of. He's doing things that nobody has ever thought of. And yet, and yet, they missed the warning of their day. Here was a man sounding his board right uh, uh, aloud every single day for 120 years. And they missed it until he walked into the ark. God shut the door to that ark and the water started coming down. That's when they went, uh-oh, it must be true what Noah was saying. It must be true what he was preaching. And Jesus says, the days leading up to his coming will be the same as the days of Noah. What else was going on in the days of Noah? What else was happening in those days? I'm going to send us to Genesis chapter 6, verse 1 through 16. I mean, through 11, I think we'll capture all that there. Um, and I'm not going to read the whole thing because we don't have time. But on your own time, start up in, in, in Genesis 5, actually, but then in 6, it starts giving us a glimpse of what was happening in the days of Noah. The Bible says that there was increasing population. Does that sound like our day? And, and uh, trust me, I am not prescribing or subscribing to, the, to those who think we need to depopulate the earth. In fact, we have more resources in this earth for everybody. It's just in the hands of a few greedy ones. If everybody was generous and released what they, ha they have stored up and hoarded in, in their accounts and in their, in their stock market and whatever else, there will be plenty for all of us, trust me. But the truth is, indeed, the population has grown. That was happening in the days of Noah, right? Genesis 6.1, you could read that. What else was happening? There was, there was sexual perversion. That's also in Genesis 6, 1. And I'm looking over here at my notes. It says, now it came to pass when men become, beca began to multiply on the face of the earth. Men began to multiply on the face of the earth. There was a, an exponential population growth. And daughters were born to them. Verse 2. The sons of God saw the daughters of men and they were that they were beautiful and they took wives from themselves of all whom they chose. There is sexual perversion here. The angelic beings, which the scripture refers to as the sons of God, began to take daughters from among men. Remember, angels are by God's divine command and order, not supposed to engage in sexual intercourse. Sexuality and sexual intercourse is a divinely ordained practice given to men or women. And there is a divine order for this, outside of which is perversion. And scripture says the angelic beings who are ob 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 uh, 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 not supposed to engage in sexual contact began to have intercourse with daughters of men. And they birthed giants, the Nephilims, if you will. And, and, and scripture mentions it a little bit here. I think Jude mentions it a little as well, it, but, but there is a non-canonical book, the book of Enoch, that is not canonized, that also gives some detail to the times of Noah, and specifically concerning the interaction of the angels and the daughters of men, and how they created these beastly creatures of giants, that were not within the divine order of God. So let me categorically also include it here. Any sexual practice outside of the law, the permitted will of God is perversion. And we see that happening in our day like you wouldn't believe it. People have 
trans have have gone beyond what is natural to engage in things that are unnatural and you guys know specifically and very well what i'm talking about anything outside of the law of god outside of the will of god outside of the purpose of god is perversion whether it's a man with a man woman with woman woman with beast man with beast it's perversion Man with multiple women, women, woman with multiple men, it's perversion. This is what was happening in the days of Noah. And the other thing that was happening is we see this demonic activity where these this, this fallen angels, which have become demonic entities and have brought forth ungodly spirits, begin to also roam the earth and affect the affairs of mankind. And we see that happening even today. There is a lot of demonic activity happening in the world today upon the face of the earth. And here, just a week or a few days to Halloween, let me categorically also mention that that is a perversion of the word of God, a perversion of the things of God. Nowhere in scripture are we commanded to worship the dead, to make room for demonic spirits, to invite a spirit or an entity that induces fear. Nowhere in the scriptures. This is all demonic activity. And I'm afraid some believers partake of these things as though it doesn't mean anything. Stay away from it if you're a child of God. If you are going to walk by faith, stay out of every appearance of evil, including Halloween and its celebrations. Oh yeah, it's all right to cut the pumpkins and good make some pumpkin bread out of it and eat. Yes, it's okay to get your corn, colored corn, the purple, the red, the yellow, whatever. It's okay. Eat it. But if you're doing that as some way to pay respect to some demonic entity, to some gone, long gone relative, it is demonic. It is perversion. And the word of God forbids us to consult the dead. The word of God forbids us to have interaction with those who have passed on. The word of God forbids us to have contact and seek help from the dead. Those are demonic spirits. They're familiar spirits. There is a great chiasm when you read in the book of Matthew where Jesus is giving the parable of Abraham and the leper that died, the rich man, sorry, and, and the leper that died. And the leper was found on the side of Abraham, sitting and laying on Abraham's chest. And on the other side was the rich man who lived in luxury all his life and paid attention to no one, where he was in a fire that nobody could quench for him. And there was a big chiasm between them. Read the word of God. It forbids us to have contact with the dead when that man begs of Abraham and says please send my, my send this man over to warn my brothers so they don't come to where I am Abraham said no they have the prophets over there to warn them why do you think scripture did not allow this man to come from the dead to warn the brothers of the rich man it's because the Bible says they have the prophets over there who are still alive. And may I dare to say, there are prophetic voices in our generation. There are men and women of God sowing the seed of the word of God. If you cannot hear them, it does not matter that a demon will come from hell to tell you. You still won't hear it. What else was going on, Rose? The Bible says there was increasing evil intents in the thoughts of and hearts of men right the bible if you read that the bible says it, that there was there was it, that every intent of the thoughts of men became increasingly evil that is spot on for our generation 
Just when I, I think to myself, I, I have not seen such an evil, something else happens that totally shakes me out of my socks. Like, really? Somebody conjured that in their mind and actually acted on it? Yes. The thoughts and the intents of man have continually and increasingly become evil. And the Bible says there was widespread corruption and violence. Does that speak to our day? The corruption of our day? The increasing violence of our day? You could literally see somebody walking down the street and gets jumped. Somebody's laying comfortably in their house and they get robbed and murdered. How many stories do we hear so and so found dead in their home? Spot on. This is our generation. And Jesus prophesied to us. He said, as the days of Noah were, so will the days of the coming of the Son of Man be. And right around that time, when evil is increasing, when demonic activity is increasing, when there is perversion on every side, a young boy is born. Genesis 5, 29 and 30 says, and he called his name Noah, saying, the one who will comfort us concerning our work and the toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord has cursed. This is, this is a, a Lamech, I believe, was the father of Noah. He gives birth to you, this young boy, and he looks up yonder in time, and he says, this is the man that will comfort us concerning our work and our toil because of the land which the Lord has cursed. You see, the land was cursed because of sin. And as evil increased, the land also continued to increase the labor and the toil of mankind. And these people leading up to the, to the, the birth of Noah had felt every pain and every toil of a hardened and cursed land. And they were hoping and looking to someday finding some consolation. They were hoping and looking to someday finding some comfort, some rest from the toil of their hands. And as we get down into Genesis 6 and verse 8 and 9, the Bible says, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God. So here's a young boy born into the earth that is cursed, into the earth that is violent, into the earth that is restless under sin, under perversion, under a, 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 a population weighing it heavy. This is a man who comes to the rescue. And dare I say, sometimes salvation comes in ways we do not think. Salvation comes in a way that is different from the thoughts and imaginations of man. I don't know what people were expecting to see happen when Noah came as the consolation. I don't know what people were hoping he will do to comfort them. Because clearly his father has godly insight he has divine revelation concerning the destiny of this child. And he says, this one will comfort us concerning our work and our toil. What was Lamech hoping for? That somehow Noah will add a kadabra, add some words and, and magic would happen and the world will be cleared of its pain and its toil? Was he hoping maybe that Noah will die for them? Was he hoping that Noah will cleanse whatever they considered evil and leave more alive, not just his only, or his only family? I don't know. I am not sure what Noah's dad was looking forward to. But I'm glad he, he proclaimed a prophecy concerning his son. And the Bible says, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. I pray that we find grace in the eyes of the Lord. See, grace is not earned. 
Grace is not worked up. Grace is not toiled for like they were toiling. Grace is found in the eyes of the Lord. How do I find grace in the eyes of the Lord? How do you and I find grace in the eyes of the Lord? Paul writing to the Ephesians, chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, he says, by, For by grace you have been saved through faith. Uh-oh. You mean we can't get away from this word faith? Uh-uh. You're saved by grace through faith. Grace saves you, but grace employs faith. Grace saves you, but grace utilizes the vehicle of faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ for good works. Here we go again. We are created in Christ. And here is his purpose for creating us. Good works. Faith without works is dead. Works must accompany faith. Works will not save you. Grace saves you by faith. And the Bible says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You and I need to be walking in good works. Hallelujah. Because God created us for that. God created us to walk in good works. God created us for good works. Praise the name of the Lord. And he says, Noah found grace. We need to find grace today. When the whole world is in pain, toiling under the weight of sin, heavy under demonic activity, oh, overrun by evil and violence and corruption, we need to be seeking to find the grace of God. Rose, how do I find grace with God? It's given in Christ Jesus. All you have to do is believe. Believe and call on the name of the Lord. That's all you got to do. You can't work it up. You can't go to work eight hours a day, 40 hours a week and make it up. You can't. It's by faith. It's by believing on the Son of God who died for us. Gave himself for us. People have defined grace it's the undeserved favor of God, the unmerited favor of God. Let me tell you something else. Faith is also comfort and consolation and rest from your toil. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. That was grace that Noah had on his life. It brought comfort. It brought consolation. It brought rest from the toil of his day. That's what grace will do for you today. The Bible declares, oh, I thank God for the book of Hebrews. I could live on this book almost every day, right? The Bible says there remains a rest for the people of God. And I wish I had it here. Ah. I want to say it's, it's Hebrews 5. Don't, don't quote me on this. I'll find it and add it on later. But the Bible says there remains a rest for the people of God. Have you entered the rest of God? Have you entered the comfort of God? Have you entered the consolation of God? You don't have to wait until you die. In fact, there are people who will die thinking they are entering the rest of God only to find themselves in the same position as the rich man was in. Don't wait to die and pass on to the other side to find comfort and consolation. You can find it right here, right now, on this side of eternity. Grace is also the power of God for us to live a godly life. Paul put it this way in 2 Corinthians 9 and 8. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you... Always having sufficiency of all things. Grace is sufficiency of all things. 
you may have an abundance for every good work. Here we go, good works again. When you are drawing from the grace of God, you cannot lack the power and the gifts to do good works. When you are drawing from the divine, undeserved favor of God, you cannot fall short of what you need to do the right thing. Paul declares again in 2 Corinthians 12 and 9, he says he, he was battling a thorn in his flesh. And he had come to, he had done everything he knew. He had prayed to the Lord three times and said, Lord, take this thorn away from me. Are you having a thorn in your life today? Is there a thorn in your flesh today? The day I learned that secret, my life turned around. Oh, I, I learned that the thorns didn't all have to be removed. For me to enjoy peace and comfort and rest. I learned that everything didn't have to be perfect in my eyes for me to enjoy my life. I learned that even with a thorn in my side, I could still find the grace to supply to that area of my life and find the strength to do the right thing and find the comfort and the consolation in my circumstances. And here's what the word says in 2 Corinthians 12 and 9. And he said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. I have long learned now not to run away from my weaknesses, not to run away from my infirmities. I have long learned now not to look upon them with despise, but to thank God that in my weakness, his power is made perfect. Oh, no. I don't have to be uh, strong like anybody else in the world. I do not have to be uh, eloquent and learned like everybody else in the world. I do not have to have it all together like some people may put it out there on social media. In my weakness, the power of God is made strong. And so can you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We don't have to run away from every thorn. We don't have to try to get it all taken care of. We don't have to pluck it all out. Let, some, some of these thorns need to stay. They need to stay. Scripture says concerning the parable of the wheat and the tares, let them grow together. Some things need to grow together with us. Hallelujah. 1 Corinthians 15 and 10. Bible says, but the grace of God but by the grace of God, I am what I am today. And his grace toward me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Can you stand up on top of your world today and declare that by the grace of God, you are who you are today? Or is it because of your, your brother who put you where you are today? Can you declare, oh, without any doubt and say, it is only by the grace of God that I am who I am today that I'm doing what I'm doing today, that I have accomplished what I have accomplished today? Or are you looking back to your uncle, to your brother, to your sister, to your father, to your pastor? What if they're all removed? All you'd have left is the grace of God. Can you still go on if all you had was the grace of God? Can you still have a testimony if all you had was the grace of God? Can you still glorify the name of the Lord if all you had was the grace of God? Paul says he could. He could. Hallelujah. And he gives thanks to God. He says, thank God his grace was not in vain. Bless the name of Jesus, the grace of God, the undeserved favor, the comfort, the consolation, the rest from our toil, the power of God to live for him and be for him who he wants us to be, regardless of what's happening around us. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. I challenge you today, find grace. It is free after all. You can't make it on your own. Come to Jesus. 
come to him and say, Lord, today I want to receive this unmerited favor. Today I want to receive this consolation. Today I want to receive rest from all my toil and all my work. Today I want to receive your power to live for you. And the Bible says his grace is sufficient. No matter what your thorn is, his grace is sufficient. Maybe you're wrestling with addictions. His grace is sufficient. There is power to overcome addictions. Maybe you're wrestling with sexual perversion. His power is sufficient to overcome sexual perversion. I was wrestling with anger. Oh, his power has helped me overcome anger. Yes! You may be wrestling with poverty. His grace is sufficient to overcome poverty. My God, what else do you want to put in that blank? What are you wrestling with? His grace is sufficient. And like Noah, the Lord will comfort us concerning our work and the toil of our hands because of the ground that the Lord has cursed. I'm going to stop there for today. I've gone way over that, what I thought. But next Sunday, by God's grace, if he tarries, we're going to be right here going into part two of Noah. And God will have something great for us even then. Father, we thank you. Your word is great. Your grace is sufficient. We receive it by faith. And we thank you that it is sufficient for every need in our lives. May we find favor in your eyes. May we find consolation in your hands. Lord God, may we find comfort and rest from our toil in you. The Sabbath rest of God. Hallelujah. And God, I pray, may we have, have power today to overcome our weaknesses. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you, dear ones. Till next time.